Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the properties of minerals, the properties that you can use to identify them in hand sample at a hobbyist level, or at a very introductory level of what are the, some of the basic physical attributes that minerals express. It's all based upon their structure. I talked in the previous lecture about ionic bonding, covalent bonding, metallic bonding in minerals. Most of the rocks of the crust and mantle are silicate minerals that are mostly ionic to a small amount of covalent bonded in their lattice arrangements. Mantle rock, peridotite, basaltic rock of the ocean crust, granitic rock of the continental crust, these are all primarily silicates. There are also oxide minerals and sulfides and others, which I will talk about in separate lectures. But for the most part, we're talking about silicates. And silicates are based upon crystal arrangements of can be a lot of rock forming elements, a lot of different rock forming elements. But what they have in common is that the arrangements, the lattice structures are all based around associations of covalently bonded SiO4 groups, groups that we call silica tetrahedra, because they take a tetrahedral form. The way the silicon and the oxygens in a silicate mineral behave, they arrange themselves naturally into these tetrahedral shapes, like a four sided dice. Silica tetrahedra are formed because silicon itself as an atom has the capacity to bond with four things, Si plus four as an ion, and oxygen is around to form with it. And so you form silicon oxygen bonds. In fact, about half of the mass of the crust is oxygen, if you look at it just in terms of the elemental composition of the rock itself. So these silica tetrahedra form the basis of more complex minerals that can get actually really complicated. And we're not going to get into that in this lecture so much. I'm going to talk primarily about the physical properties of minerals. But the physical properties of minerals are the result of the chemical properties of the elements they're, they're made of and the arrangements of those elements. Minerals like olivine, for example, magnesium iron silicate, is a mineral you associate with high temperature magma. You find it in basalt. You find it in ocean crust and, of course, in the mantle. And olivine, in fact, makes up a large fraction of the mantle. It is one of the primary minerals down there. It also occurs when it's uh, really nice quality, uh, gem quality uh, samples of, of olivine are called peridot or peridot. Uh, bright green, actually. Not quite as brilliant as an emerald, but quite pretty. So olivine is a silicate. Its structure is based upon silica tetrahedra. They're arranged in structures where isolated tetrahedra are bonded to other metal cations, iron or magnesium, and then two other silica tetrahedra. So olivine is a fairly uh, low strength, soft mineral. Uh, its structure is not particularly resilient. And in fact, it weathers quite readily at the Earth's surface to form other minerals. If you look at something, however, like quartz, which is highly structured and ordered, quartz is made up entirely of silica tetrahedra and no other cations are necessary because the tetrahedra are all bonded to each other in a way that makes the overall structure very strong and no other metals are needed. It's SiO2 is the formula. Quartz is what we call polymerized. The silica tetrahedra are all formed to connect to each other. They're formed into structures that produce a hexagonal arrangement and so the crystals at the macro scale are hexagonal. Quartz is a very hard mineral too because the well-ordered silica oxygen tetrahedra in its structure give it strength. I'll talk more about silicate types of minerals in another lecture, but for now, I just want to introduce the concept that this is why minerals have the properties they do. It's the structure, the specific chemical structure and composition of the minerals. You can identify a mineral through several different types of properties, including color, streak, hardness, density, and things like that. And let's go through some of these. Color, first off, it's the most obvious property of a mineral sample. If you look at a hand sample, you look at the, the color of it, it's the first thing you notice, or probably will be. But in reality, for a geologist, color though obvious, is not a particularly useful property to rely on for quick and dirty hand sample identification. And that's because color can vary a lot based upon trace element content. A trace element that may be present in no more than a few parts per million in the structure will give you different chemical bonds that will absorb light and reflect light and give you color. So quartz could be clear, it could be purple amethyst, it could be orange, it can be yellow, it can be green, it can even be black or pink. So the color of quartz is not what people use to identify it. Other things like hardness and crystal structure, crystal habit, uh, geometry of the crystal, things like that are, are much more useful. The color is a very striking, obviously, attribute of, of any mineral or rock sample. Transparency, 
Transparency is whether a crystal is transparent like glass or is more opaque or something in between. This property is useful. Uh, certain minerals will only exhibit certain types of transparency, but it can also be a property that varies a lot within one mineral type. If you look at calcite here, calcium carbonate, depending upon how it grew as a crystal, you can have optically clear calcite or you can have opaque calcite as on the right. Transparency is useful but not particularly diagnostic depending upon how the crystal grew. Other properties such as luster can be actually much more helpful to identify. Luster is not the color, it's not the transparency, it's the visual appearance based upon how light reflects off its surface. So you can say that it's, uh, for example a piece of galena there has a very bright reflective surface that looks like a metal and so we call that metallic luster. It's not really a metal, it's a lead sulfide mineral, but it looks like a metal, so we call it metallic luster. Clear quartz can have a glassy luster, or vitreous, meaning it's foggy or translucent. Uh, minerals can look pearly, they can look greasy, earthy, dull. Uh, basically, different adjectives can be conjured up to describe different types of luster of a mineral, because this can be a pretty diagnostic property. If you're ever into rock collecting as a kid or you collected samples of rocks in little array boxes or something, you're familiar with what's called the streak test. This is a pretty low-tech method of identifying minerals, and it's not particularly useful at a professional level, but it's interesting because it can tell one mineral for another based on if they look the same color, but in fact they're very different in composition. Streak is a test where you're using the mineral sample you have essentially as a colored pencil, scraping it against a piece of unglazed porcelain, and people typically use white porcelain or black because some tr streak traces are, are light colored, like you see on the right with sulfur there. But what streak is is simply the color of the powdered mineral. Minerals that have, like I said, similar color but are different in composition have a very different streak. This is something you might use in the field, something a prospector might use. It's not something you do in the lab, but it can be pretty diagnostic. It only works for soft minerals though. Very hard minerals that are harder than the porcelain, obviously, uh, will scratch the porcelain instead of this porcelain scratching them. Crystal habit. The overall form in which a crystal can grow. Crystal habit is basically what is the overall shape of the crystal? Is it something that's bladed like a sword? Is it fibrous, like fibrous asbestos? Is it banded? Is it a blocky thing? Tabular, meaning long but squarish crystals like a table. What are the shapes that the crystal grows in? And typically there's only a few characteristic crystal habits for particular minerals, but some minerals can show lots of different habit. Density. Minerals vary in density. Some of them are pretty light, some of them are pretty heavy. Uh, minerals are composed of heavy elements, uh, magnesium, iron, along with silicon, forming lattice structures that can be pretty dense. Olivine, for example, is a dense mantle mineral found also in basalt. And its density is about 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter, or grams per cc. Quartz, on the other hand, is lighter. It's about 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's about the range you see for most rocks. They go somewhere between about 3.5 to about 2.5 grams per cubic centimeter, where the denser ones being richer in magnesium and iron and calcium and the lighter ones being richer in something like sodium, potassium, uh, and of course, silicon oxide itself. Uh, for comparison, water has, at room temperature, a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. At one time, density was referred to more often as specific gravity, meaning it was compared with the density of water. Cleavage and fracture. Minerals cleave, they break, and they fracture along lines based upon what the crystal lattice structure looks like. A mineral such as muscovite here is a crystal structure that forms thin sheets, thin planes, where the bonding within the plane, within the sheet, is quite strong, but the bonding between sheets is very weak. So when muscovite or other forms of mica, like biotite, chlorite, when samples of this, these things break, they cleave into thin plates. Other minerals have more complex, different forms of cleavage. For example, if you look at the mineral fluorite, it doesn't cleave in one direction like mica does. It tends to cleave in four directions. And so it'll weather out of a piece of larger rock. It'll break out of that in octahedral shapes, or it'll grow in octahedral shapes in the first place. So the cleavage can actually be a very useful property to look at a mineral and try to identify it. Hardness. The hardness of a mineral is a characteristic property directly related to the strength and the structure of its crystal lattice. The common scale that we use is the Mohs hardness scale, named after Friedrich Mohs, who pioneered this, who developed 
the hardness scale back in the 1700s. And his hardness scale is based on a comparison of the hardness of different minerals to each other. Starting at the hardness of one, he assigned to talc, which is a very soft mineral and will powder easily. Talcum powder is just powdered talc. It's a clay mineral. Gypsum at number two. Calcite is harder than gypsum at number three. Harder than calcite is fluorite at number four. Apatite at five. Orthoclase at six. Quartz at seven. Topaz at eight. Corundum at nine. And diamond famously at ten. The maximum hardness. Diamond is the hardest mineral known. And it will scratch any mineral softer than it. And that's basically how the Mohs hardness scale works. If you can scratch or be scratched by minerals on this list, that is, if you take a piece of quartz, you can't use it to scratch a piece of corundum. But a piece of corundum, aluminum oxide, will scratch a piece of quartz. And so by this comparison, you can judge the relative hardness of different minerals. Uh, something like a fingernail keratin of the fingernail has a hardness of about 2.5, a little bit between gypsum and calcite. A copper penny at 3.5. A knife made of steel or a glass plate typically is around a hardness of 5.5. So a good middle range to judge whether you're looking at quartz or something that just looks like it but is very soft. Interestingly, the hardness scale that Mohs developed is a relative hardness scale, and so is sort of qualitative. But if you look at it quantitatively, if you actually assess what the hardness is of these minerals in a laboratory setting, then in fact what you find is is quite striking that from hardness 1 to hardness 9 does in fact vary over a fairly smooth slope. They're not all that different from each other in the amount of force that they can take before being scratched. But then you have diamond, which is way of an outlier. It's much harder than corundum, which is right behind it on the scale. So it bears keeping in mind that the scale is fairly linear for other minerals except diamond, which is just really anomalously tough. There are a range of other properties, too, that you can use to identify minerals. And they range from things that we just talked about, which are fairly common properties of all minerals, color, hardness, streak, things like that. But you also have properties like magnetism, magnetite, the mineral magnetite, Fe304, iron oxide, is magnetic. And most other minerals are not magnetic. So it's a good way of quickly and easily identifying what it is. Reactivity to chemicals. Famously, if you use an eyedropper to put some hydrochloric acid or perhaps vinegar on a piece of limestone, it will react vigorously. It will fizz. This is a very useful test to determine if you're looking at some kind of gray sandstone with fine grains to it or a limestone that's made of calcium carbonate. Another visually striking property of minerals can be fluorescence or phosphorescence. Essentially, fluorescence is that the mineral will emit light when exposed to ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet light kicks electrons in the mineral's lattice structure into higher energy states, and they will then tumble back to their ground state by emitting photons of light. They'll emit longer wavelengths than they absorb. Fluorescent minerals are minerals that respond like that. They may contain trace element content that promotes fluorescence. Calcite, for example, can be both fluorescent and non, based upon what trace element content it has. It's useful for identifying hand samples in the field if you carry a small pocket UV light with you. And obviously collections of fluorescent minerals prepared and displayed uh, dramatically can be quite spectacular to look at. 